Well, I grew up um, in Africa, and I grew up actually on, on a big farm in the South Kinnikop region in the Highlands, 9,000 feet, up in the Highlands of, <laughs> of uh, Kenya, as it was known then. And um, it was very adventurous. As kids, we did nothing. We, we, there were only like four families up there, one of which was the Nightingale family. And to get to them, we had to use our horses to go there. And so one had this juxtaposition of during the day, um, you're out riding your horses, age, literally three onwards. And, you, and then you went shooting uh, in the forest. It was okay, of course, in those days. And then uh, your mother would tell you, please try and be back by nightfall, darling. You know? And so you'd come back and your horses. And that, and that was it. And you, know, you had to be, be careful of the leopard. Um, when you come back, there's a bad leopard in that area. So you'd make sure you got back before nightfall. And then, then, you, had, then you had my mother, who was a very elegant lady, you know, uh, from England. And she, she went to Benenden. And, and she had a home with beautiful... And up at that altitude of 9,000 feet, you grew daffodils and, and bluebells. And, and so the house always had these beautiful flowers. And then you'd sit down and you'd have silver at dinner. And my father would insist every... I think it was Friday night or Saturday night, and when I was old enough that you had to go and you, you toast the king, I think. And um, so one had this very elegant home life where your mother insisted on afternoon tea on the terrace. And then, then this crazy, like, Lord of the Flies kids, you know, running completely wild. And then at um, 16, I got fed up and uh, I, bought, I had my own business already and I, made, I had a motorbike. And I, my father was really trying to be so... Con he was a British Army officer, very, very proper. And I, I got fed up at home, and so he said, where are you going? So I said, I'm going to Cape Town. He said, do you know where Cape Town is? I said, yes, here's a map. I remember getting out a shell map, just an ordinary shell map. He said, look, it's at the end of Africa, it's here. That's where I'm off to. He said, have you planned? I said, no. When are you going? I said, now. And I did. I left. I went to Nairobi, bought some raisins, some biltong, the dried meat, uh, a sleeping bag, panniers for my fuel and my petrol. And that was it. And I went, got on the Namanga Road. Drove down to Tanganyika as it was then, then on to Portuguese East Africa, ended up in the, in the bottom of the Zambezi River, got marooned there for a month, rescued by a Rhodesian army patrol. So get in, get in, get in, get in. I said, why? I've been here for a month. They're really nice people. No, we're at war, we're at war. No, no, fine, don't worry. So I finally get to Cape Town and came the first person in the world to, to drive a motorbike from Nairobi to Cape Town. But I think my father and mother were actually quite horrified. They said, you know, what, are we, what, what is this? And so... <laughs> So uh, my father was right. Looking back on it, he, um, I always thank him so profusely uh, for sending me to Santos. At almost the same time, 1962, uh, uh, we lost all of our, our farms in, in, in the highlands of Kenya. And my parents were very, very distressed. And I came back on leave. I remember we went to the coast, uh, Diani Beach, and had a long meeting. And I said, well, let's, let's start a company. And so we started Abercrombie and Kent. But we made up the name. Abercrombie, because in those days, you really needed, I, I, I really felt we had to have a posh name, you know, and so uh, Kent, and, and also I wanted a name that was top of the yellow pages. We didn't have internet in those days, and so, to be, and so I came up with Aardvark first, which was two A's, but then um, the logo wouldn't have been good. No? <laughs> so we, we gave that up, and we came up with the name Abercrombie, A, B, and it sounded wonderful, and he became our partner. So that's how it started. And it was just my mother, my father, myself. And um, my father did all the books, and, and my mother and I were guides. And we had our Land Rovers, and off we went. Everything in my whole life has, has been sort of by design and by accident. I think, I think what I've always been is very competitive. Um, always. And so the minute I got one Land Rover, I wanted two. And then I saw Car and Downey next to our competitor, I said, we'll beat them. And then I saw Overland Company, which became UTC, the Zebra Bus Company. So I started my son that actually, whenever he saw one, he had to make a rude face at it. You know? and so, so, you know, I've always been competitive like that. And I think that, actually, I owe it mainly to my early clients. And my early clients were people like David Rockefeller, um, you know, who, who I was their guide. And George S. Moore of Citibank was the most probably the most powerful bank of the, of the 60s and early 70s. And he actually said to me one, it was him, and, uh, uh, who said to me, you know what, Jeffrey, you, you shouldn't be driving this, being a, a guide like this the rest of your life. Let me help you with it. And he flew me to America, and he introduced me to people. He showed me, he sent me in what I now know to be an analyst who came down to stay with me in Africa for three months, who now wrote what I know, which, which I now know to be a business plan. 
uh, but basically it was to buy more Land Rovers, hire more guides, and get into the office myself, which is what I did. I would say A&K is rather like, um, uh, I know you've been to Africa, but you know when an elephant migrates, you can always tell where the migratory paths are, because obviously uh, they have their dung, and the dung uh, has some seeds in it, and from the seeds uh, grow acacia trees. So actually, the old elephant migratory routes could be tracked by trees and plants, which grew out of, the, uh, grew out of their dung. So Abercrombie can, wherever I go, like in the early days, I go down to you know, Zimbabwe, or South Africa, or anyway, Egypt, and I, or India, I said, let's open an Abercrombie can office. So wherever I went, I literally planted a seed. And I planted the seed in England in 1972. Uh, we opened with one office in the old Trafalgar Grand Square building. One, one person, one office. But if you, I think if you set your mind and you have unli unlimited ambition and, and go for it and really do a good job every day, uh, you can do whatever you want, really. What we actually did in Abercrombie and Kent in the early 60s was I invented the luxury tent safari. Because up until that time, you, ever went, you went into a lodge with a camera, or you went hunting with Kandani to shoot animals, right? Why it had never been done before in a tent was there was no refrigeration. And so I basically used my army background to bring down an army engineer. And together, we took a year, and we, we put the refrigeration, which I used to have in my tanks in the Libyan desert, I put into old army 4x4 four four Bedfords, which I bought from the auction. And so we were the first to come up with a deep freeze system whereby suddenly, in the middle of the bush, you could have caviar, you could have butter, you could have martinis, and that's what we did. So the areas were always there, but we took people there in a different manner. So the, the concept was, have this huge adventure during the day with all these excitements, just like my the farm and the kindergarten, right? And at night, come back to the cut glass, the silver, the caviar, and then here, be clever, and uh, put the camp next to the river so, so, you know, 30 hippos would be watching you. So nothing has really changed. We, I go around the world, I just got back um, uh, from uh, Brazil, and you know, looking at the Pantanal, where you can see Jaguar, but we'll build a lodge there, because it's too hot, not a camp. We went to Antarctica, so we, we, we had to build a ship to do that. We went to Egypt, we went to Galapagos. We just finished a brand new ship on the Yangtze River in China. So it's, m it's more looking at a wonderful place to go to and then building a product in which to stay and then putting in, we're really a logistic company, putting in the logistics behind it so that everything works in a seamless fashion and then have the best guides in the world to take care of your customers. That's real simple and you repeat that. At the time of 9-11, it wasn't almost like looking at uh, a charging elephant and actually he's now within two feet of you and you're saying, what now? This is it. So it was very, very difficult. Everything that could have gone wrong went wrong. Iraq war, uh, Americans refusing to go to Europe because of France, uh, SARS, British Airways closing down, not going to Kenya for 18 months. It was like, this is a plot. This is a plot to fool me, you know? And um, I think, all right, what did I do? Not, not what I would do, what I did was focus. I decided not to see anybody for about two or three years and I just spent all that time working. And I, each morning, because there were so many problems, I mean there were just so many that I had to, I, all my army discipline came into being and, and I put every, every problem into a box. Then I had a, a strategy per box and each morning I said, right, today is the uh, financial box, banks today. And another one is, is um, uh, cash flow day, right? So you take each box at a turn and you'd focus in on it in a sort of maniac way and just would just do nothing, don't get distracted, just spend 12, 16 hours a day, whatever it had, to focus on the issue. And, but if you see them all at once, I think you give up. I think it's just too much. And that's what most people do. You've got to have a plan. Too many people go into these uh, crises without a strategic plan. Well, I mean, I say connect the dots. It must be one, to another. this plan mustn't be swirly or unworked out. It's a ruthless strategic plan. So if you don't hit uh, revenues which you expect to hit, don't pray and think, oh, it'll get better tomorrow, or hear the politicians saying, oh, we're on the verge of... No, no, you're not. 
Believe in the facts, not in emotions. Follow the facts and make a plan to the facts. Abercrombie & Kent is really a luxury adventure company. It's really an experiential company. And remember that although we have some famous people, actually Abercrombie & Kent is built on Mr. and Mrs. next door, people in the Abercrombie & Kent office here today. And our actual price is approximately £286 a day. Now you can spend that at lunch probably in one of your fancy restaurants in, in St. James. But, so it's not that expensive. So you have to dispel that rumor. That's point one. Point two, what people are doing today, they are spurning what I call hedonistic luxury um, holidays. Private jets, no. Uh, luxury yachts, no. Luxury cruise ships, maybe, but probably no. But we're experiential travel, taking the family and the grandkids or the kids to Africa where you can learn about the country. You almost, it's a duty for you to travel at this time. Because what's, what are all these emerging countries going to do who rely on tourism? So it's not something to feel ashamed of, it's something that you should do and educate yourself on. And I say, I always have this great feeling about, you know, if you're, you're about to die in three days' time, all right? And you suddenly say, wow, I'm about to die in three days' time. And instead of worrying, and I'm sure what you're going to think of, I should have, I should have seen Machu Picchu at dawn. Well, you know, I never saw the pyramids. Had all those chances, never did. Never saw a jaguar. You know, and so my, my whole thing in life is get out there because that's actually what you're going to take with you. And by the way, today, with interest rates as they are, why leave the money in the bank, right? Uh, you might as well go and spend it with your, with your kids and grandchildren. At least, they, at least leave them some memories. Well, Abercrombie and Kent is always, we have always been very, very aware of the environment. In fact, in 1982, we started uh, Friends of Conservation. Uh, which then morphed into Abercrombie and Kent Philanthropy. And so we've been doing this for years. And, and what, what do we do? We base our philanthropy around health, education, and the ecology. And then we base it around where we operate, where our properties are. So that when our, when our guests and clients come, we actually make a point of not just showing them the wonderful food in our lodges, but actually, for instance, at our new Swallow camp in Tarangiri, going to the Jedabong school which we built and seeing the school kids there at Alanana in the Maasai Mara planting trees. I went down the other day, planted two trees. We have an amazing biogas plant up in the Maasai village. I went there the other day and it's really quite surprising. You know, I grew up with the Maasai and here they are, if you can believe, in their little huts with a little, little, bio, little, little flame, you know, they're cooking on it and everything else, not tearing down firewood. All comes from the manure of their cattle. And so, these are the things we do and build. So it's education of the local people, um, taking care of their health, health clinics, and, um, and then putting a lot of money into the actual ecology, anti-poaching, and all those sort of things. But we feel very good about it, and what we found is more recently, our, our clients are very aware of it. And they actually, they almost demand it now. They almost demand when they're booking, say, what is Abercrombie & Kent doing about the climate? What is Abercrombie & Kent? doing in Botswana with this AIDS crisis? What is Abercrombie and Kent doing about the education of young children who have to walk 20 miles uh, just to learn how to read and, and basically to eat as well? They have no food. It's almost your responsibility to actually go and travel to some of these areas to help with their economies. Because otherwise, what are they doing? We think we have recession. You should see the recession going on in, in, in places of South America now and in places in Africa now. They're having a serious recession, like $1 a day recession. That's their income. Anyone who even dares to start an argument, do we have climate change or not, that's just ridiculous. Uh, totally finished. We have a big problem. And you know, our ships, we've been going to Antarctica for 27 years, all right? In the early days, you couldn't even get to Ross Island. Now you just sail around Ross Island. I've been to the North Pole. Um, it's the, the, uh, the Arctic in the north is definitely, definitely melting. And we all know what that's going to do with the Gulf Stream. And so we know that we have a big problem. Are people aware? Yes, they are. And I think more than ever before. Um, I think uh, what Prince Charles has done uh, with his message of climate change, um, all the messages uh, coming out of the World Economic Forum. I'm chairman of the World Travel and Tourism Council. 
which is the 100 CEOs of the private sector, the world's largest uh, private sector body. Uh, I just got back from Brazil, met with President Lula. Um, all the presidents are very aware of this now. Uh, people are demanding it and we have to move fast because we have an unprecedented crisis coming down our way and unlike the um, uh, financial crisis, I don't think um, it's going to be that easy to call in a quick restructure.